Hello, University of Oregon Ducks fans. Sorry if I sound a bit slow today. I was up until 6 a.m. in the morning working on all of our fishduck.com Sunday game review content. I hate night games. <laughs> So it was quite the weekend for the Ducks, and not just in football. The Bill Dellinger Invitational was taking place on Saturday, and it's the only home cross-country event of the season. Once again, the Oregon women ran away with it, taking first place, but they slipped to third in the overall rankings. Uh, the men's team was led by Trevor Dunbar, who took the individual title, though Oregon couldn't grab the team title, which BYU claimed. Uh, on the final lap of the day. Senior Alexi Pappas won it for the women's team in very impressive fashion. She finished less than a second off of the meet record. Good enough for the second all-time best time ever at the Dillinger Invitational. Volleyball, meanwhile, appears to be the single most dominant Oregon sport this year. They're not only winning, but they're doing so in absolutely just terrorizing, dominating fashion. Friday, they beat up Utah in straight sets, 3-0 at Matt Knight Arena, then followed that up with taking down Colorado Saturday night, again in straight sets, 3-0. The Ducks are ranked number two in the country after starting the year ranked 20th, and in sets, they are now 39-3 on the year. They haven't even lost a single set since September 5th against UC Santa Barbara. Along the way, they've defeated four ranked teams. Uh, the two wins this past week were the 500th and 501st career victories for Coach Jim Moore, who has this team absolutely rolling. Thankfully, with the Pac-12 network, they're on TV a lot, so if fans can't make it out to Matt Knight Arena, definitely check it out online. Oregon Ducks Volleyball is fantastic. Oregon women's soccer, though, has hit a bit of a rough patch lately. After fighting through a scrappy 0-0 overtime game versus Colorado back on September 21st, which was televised on the Pac-12 network, the Ducks' scoring has gone cold lately. They lost 0-1 to BYU at Pape Field last Monday. And then they also lost to number 19 Cal 0-2. And they're playing Stanford in Palo Alto today as I record this. Oregon returns home this Friday and Sunday, hosting UCLA Friday night and USC Sunday afternoon. I will be in Eugene working the press box for the Washington-Oregon football game on Saturday, and I plan on being at the UCLA game Friday night at Pape Field. So if you're around Friday night in Eugene, come cheer on the Ducks with me at Pape Field. Golf season is underway now as well, and the men's team is ranked 14th in the country, having finished third earlier this past week at the St. Mary's Invitational, with the Pac-12 preview up next in Portland at Pumpkin Ridge. That's taking place October 8th and October 9th. The women's team, meanwhile, are coming off such a great season last year. Uh, they finished 12th at the Mason Rudolph Invitational this past week, and next they head off to Washington. Uh, in about a week or so for the Edian Ilhenfeldt, I hope I said that right, Invitational, October 8th, 9th, and 10th. It's also time for tennis season to start, with the men's and women's teams participating in their first tournaments of the year this week. Then, of course, there is Oregon Ducks football. Oregon playing yet another night game, which means a very late night for me to accommodate national TV coverage and guaranteeing I would get no sleep last night, defeating Washington 51-26. This seemed like a typical Oregon game. Uh, the opponent plays well in the first half, playing up to this highly ranked opponent of the Oregon Ducks, and in the second half, Oregon turns on the afterburners and it's game over. Pretty typical. Yet, I don't get why fans don't recognize that this is the way that Oregon plays. There's so much cynicism among fans. If you follow the games real time on Twitter and Facebook, people act like the sky is falling because Oregon only won by almost 30. Yeah, Washington State put on a good streak there for a bit before halftime. Most teams do when they're playing against Oregon. It seems all the time where teams will play up to the opponent and fight hard against the number two team in the country. Then they get completely boat raced in the second half. This is Oregon's M.O. How do people not recognize this yet? M you know, maybe I'm just getting old, but my big question is this. When did it suddenly become not good enough for Oregon to simply win? Now Oregon has to score a touchdown on every drive, complete every pass, force a three and out every defensive stand, or else Oregon is doomed. 
You know, I miss the days when people were fans, passionate fans. We really needed to get the expectations in check. The Ducks won the game. It's sad to see how our fan base has turned into that which we hate most, because the whole reason why we hate the Washington Huskies is because of their arrogance when they were good, and we were the up-and-comers. Now those roles have reversed, and Oregon fans sound exactly like Husky fans in the early 90s. Do people even remember why we hate the Huskies now? It's win the day. It's not win the game with zero turnovers, scoring on every drive, throwing 80% completion percentage, and getting a three and out every single time the defense is on the field. Nobody plays a flawless game. Whether Oregon wins by five or by 50, it still counts as a win. On Saturday, Kenyon Barner had a really big day, racking up almost 200 yards on the ground and two touchdowns on the ground plus one through the air. Definitely a big day from him. DeAnthony Thomas was held in check, and really he has been ever since he appeared on the Sports Illustrated cover. I blame the SI Jinx, of course, as we all do, though he did score a touchdown and actually got to return a kickoff for the first time all season. A team was actually unafraid to kick to him. The defense, once again, I thought was absolutely stellar. In particular, sophomore cornerback Ifo Ekpre Olamu just continues to have a fantastic year. Total bromance with him at, at this point with me. Cougars got a gift touchdown after a bad uh, roughing the passer call and another jump ball and a double coverage late in the game and were set up on short fields with turnovers, which led to their 26 points. People may look at the box score and say, you know, why did Oregon give up so much? But, you know, Washington State has been putting up big offensive numbers and they were given some gifts. So this game played out pretty typical of what I expected. Uh, the Oregon defense absolutely menaced the Washington State cornerbacks all game. They racked up eight sacks in all, and the yardage attributed on those negative yard on those uh, sacks meant that the Cougars ended up with a net rushing total of minus eight yards on the day. Marcus Mariota had another mixed results game, which he will do as a freshman. He did a nice job of running the ball, I thought. In particular, his touchdown run was an absolute thing of beauty. And he had some nice touch passes on the day, but he also made some bad decisions, throwing a couple interceptions and not getting rid of the ball under pressure. Granted, one of those interceptions was because Pharaoh Brown fell down on his route, but still should have recognized that you don't throw the ball over the middle in that situation. Mariota remains a work in progress and will show signs of being a freshman sometimes over the course of the year. Thankfully, the defense continues to bail him out. We've been seeing all along that this could be Oregon's def best defense, and the last couple weeks they sure have shown it. Michael Clay got dinged up in the first half a little bit while sacking uh, Connor Holiday. He tweaked his hamstring and spent the second half in sweats on the sidelines. It didn't look serious though. He should be good to go next week. I've not heard of any other injuries that we know how Oregon reports on injuries these days. One area of concern with the team right now is the accuracy of the shotgun snaps from Hironis Grisou. Grisou seems to have developed a case of the Steve Sachs yips. His snaps keep going way wide left for no apparent reason, and it's really disrupting the timing of some plays. Often when a run is getting stuffed in the backfield, it's the result of the snap messing up the timing of the mesh. Even a couple times this year, there have been unintentional direct snaps to the running backs because it was so off target. Grisou is a solid player, and he will continue to improve, but if those snaps don't get on point, then nothing works. Everything is based on timing, so hopefully the coaches can get him back on track. So up next is Husky Hate Week. Washington comes to Autzen Stadium fresh off a huge upset over Stanford last Thursday night before a national TV audience. They've been devastated, absolutely devastated by serious injuries this year, yet they seem to be finding a rhythm with their backups. Their offense looked meh at best, I thought, against Stanford, but they put up just enough plays to get the W. What was scary and what we've been dreading is how well their defense played. And guess who's leading the way? A familiar name, Justin Wilcox. He was a cornerback for the Ducks in the 90s. Of course, the Wilcox name, there's been four of them who have donned Oregon jerseys. They are Oregon royalty. He was the spearhead behind Boise State's two defensive performances against Oregon in 2008 and 2009, then gave Oregon fits when he was leading the Tennessee defense in 2010 until the lightning strikes caused an hour-long delay that gave Oregon a chance to uh, recover. Now he's in charge of the Huskies defense with another Oregon Ducks great also on the coaching staff, Peter Sermon. 
and a defense that once looked like Swiss cheese now looks very competent. And that gives me a little bit of fear because anytime Justin Wilcox is leading a defense, it's bad news for Oregon. Wilcox has been an absolute thorn in Oregon's side, and I have no doubt come Saturday, he'll find a way to frustrate Oregon's offense, at least for a while. But I don't see much explosion from Washington's offense right now, especially with the injuries they've had along the offensive line. And I think Oregon's defense can really manhandle them. So don't bet for Oregon to cover the spread in this one, which they haven't really done much at all this year anyway. But I'm confident that Oregon will run away with it in the second half after Washington's defense slows down Oregon for a time in the first half. Again, a typical performance. So stop with all the cynicism, fans. It will be my first game in attendance all season this year, and I'm really looking forward to being back in Eugene and experiencing all of it, even though it will definitely be a different experience for me because I will be up in the press box instead of in the stands. And there will be a very, very special guest at Autzen Stadium come Saturday, Reggie Ogburn. Oregon's quarterback from 1979 to 1980. He was really the lightning rod that started the ball rolling in the early to mid 80s. That, you know, he's the launching point when Oregon had sunk to its lowest point in the mid to late 70s and started actually making a comeback. Everything started with those two years when Reggie Ogburn played. He's making his first trip back to Eugene since 1981. His career is highlighted by a 1980 victory over Washington in Seattle. It was the last time that Oregon beat Washington in Seattle again until 1995. It's a 15-year streak of losses uh, up in Seattle. Granted, they weren't playing every year in Seattle, but still a long time to go between victories. Reggie Ogburn was the man. We've talked a lot about Reggie on fishduck.com, we've even done an interview with him, and we're excited to be covering his return to Eugene, this time as an honorary captain for the Washington-Oregon game. With fishduck.com, we continue to do our game day coverage. On Saturdays, if you're online, be sure to follow our fishduck forum closely as we post photos from the game in real time to our game day photo thread, as well as have a big post-game write-up as well as videos. We are looking for more people to be involved in the site. So if you have interest in writing and in being involved in advertising or social media or other areas where you can lend a hand, please reach out to Charles Fisher. Charles at fishduck.com is the email address. It's Husky Hate Week, so get those memories flowing of Kenny Wheaton's going to score, of Rick Neuheisel having his whole team stomp the Oregon O. Husky fans storming the field, breaking up what would have been Oregon's game-winning touchdown on the last play in the early 60s, of all the one-sided beatdowns and of the desire to now make it nine in a row, the longest winning streak in the history of the series. So until next time, this is Kurt saying go fish, get hooked, go ducks, and huck the Fuskies.